So welcome to the third afternoon session of the ELD MOOC 2015. Welcome to all of you who joined for this session on the rationales of stakeholder involvement. I am Claudia Musekamp and I am the online tutor for this MOOC along with Ali Salha um, who will us join us later. We had announced a, a very long session um, with speakers as Robert Costanza. He couldn't make it today, but he already provided a recording. So you'll find that on the website already, a recording with a presentation of um, Robert Costanza and Ida Kubyshevsky. We also had expected uh, Thomas Falk to be speaking today, but uh, um, due to connection issues, uh, we'll have him in a, a later session. So um, today I'm very happy to welcome Ann Jubner and Stacy Noel, uh, who are joining us today from, uh, Kenya, from Nairobi in Kenya. And um, Anne Dübner and uh, Stacy Noel combine uh, 40 years of experience in um, international development. Uh, Anne Dübner is uh, working with the UN Drylands uh, Development Center in uh, Nairobi. She holds a Master of Science in Engineering and is currently working on a PhD at the University of Nairobi. So welcome Anne and welcome Stacy and Noel. Uh, you have met Stacy already in the first session of this uh, ELD MOOC. Uh, Stacy Noel is the director of the Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, the Africa office uh, based in uh, Nairobi. She holds uh, a Master of Science in Development uh, Management um, and uh, is joining us for this uh, presentation and the question and answer uh, session at the end. So welcome to uh, those who have joined in the meantime and I will uh, turn over to Anne Jübner. Please switch on your switch microphone on. and then you're on. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Claudia. Um, Stacy has uh, just moved out of the picture, but let me introduce her again, please. So here is Stacy. We uh, many greetings to everybody from uh, Nairobi. Uh, we are at uh, the UNDP office, and if I may just uh, uh, add to the introduction, um, I'm working with uh, what was formerly the Drylands Development Center of UNDP and is now the Global Policy Center for Resilient Ecosystems and Desertification, meaning that our mandate has been broadened uh, beyond the drylands, still continuing to work on the drylands agenda, but also looking at other fragile ecosystems. So I'm gonna turn it over to myself for now. Um, and I'm very happy, I have the pleasure to talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, the particular uh, UNDP support uh, that we have provided uh, through the ELD working group on uh, policy, uh, um, the policy working group on uh, options and pathways to action. And that uh, working group is headed by, uh, by Stacy. So um, uh, basically, um, we have been uh, engaged in the ELD initiative uh, from an early uh, point onwards. Um, and uh, the rationale for that was uh, to keep the transdisciplinary uh, research of the ELD initiative as closely connected to the demands and the realities at the country levels. Uh, and uh, we were asked to uh, provide and facilitate um, specific country-level consultations 
in selected countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And we did that in very close collaboration with uh, some of our uh, country offices. You might know that UNDP uh, has a very extensive network of country offices. Um, we have more than 160 offices around the world uh, and we wanted to use some of them uh, to help with these uh, consultations. Um, so the uh, overall aim of the Options and Pathways for Action Working Group uh, in the ELD initiative was to integrate stakeholder groups uh, as well as the gen uh, general public and private decision makers in the ELD initiative at all stages of it uh, to generate comments and feedback uh, from them uh, to help guide the development uh, of the ELD initiative approach as well as the practical application of it at the country level. And uh, also to share feedback with the other ELD working groups you might know, I believe Stacy uh, talked to you about it two weeks ago, that there are two other working groups, one working group that is led by uh, Bob Constanza on uh, the uh, uh, methodology of the ELD initiative and another working group that is led by my colleague here, also based in Nairobi at the United Nations Environment Program at UNEP uh, on the modeling of scenarios. So whatever feedback we got from our stakeholders in our working group uh, was of course uh, also to be shared with the other working groups. Now, um, why did we consult with stakeholders? And uh, I'm, uh, uh, I would like to refer you and invite you also, as uh, Claudia did, uh, uh, to please uh, take a look at uh, the presentation from our colleague from uh, uh, Tobias, who unfortunately could not join uh, today due to a bad connection. Uh, but he has a very nice presentation on uh, uh, the more uh, theoretical aspects on why it is important to widely consult with stakeholders. Um, let me just uh, reflect a little bit about uh, our rationale why we involved stakeholders uh, in the exercise here in the consultations uh, at the country level. Uh, first of all, it really was uh, uh, an objective for ourselves to better understand the, uh, uh, the issues uh, relating to sustainable land management, to land degradation issues in each country. Um, we, of course, have an overall understanding, uh, but uh, it was, uh, we felt it was uh, extremely important for us to better understand it in more detail and from different perspectives. Um, secondly, um, we are of course also very concerned uh, about uh, ensuring participation from different groups within society. Um, we have a tendency uh, to involve those groups who are readily available, but uh, um, in many countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, one set of people who are particularly difficult to get on the table for these discussions are the pastoralists and people who are particularly poor, who have uh, often not the time to waste in workshops, so to speak, because they are busy uh, uh, to cater for the survival of themselves and their families. And it's extremely important in these discussions to have really uh, everybody on board uh, for all voices to be heard. Uh, thirdly, um, it is, uh, we, we considered it very important to, uh, through the consultations and through the fact that we uh, were bringing the different uh, uh, perspectives and different stakeholders uh, together on one table, with that, we created particular platforms for discussion, uh, which were not necessarily that common uh, and uh, where particular discussions might not have happened otherwise. Uh, to give you an example, it, is, uh, it was very uncommon to have uh, 
uh, people from the private sector engage with academics and with uh, uh, with international organizations uh, because we don't really mix that well since we have uh, uh, quite often uh, different uh, uh, different goals and different objectives to follow so the the mere fact that uh, we were all on one table and were able to exchange and discuss those issues jointly actually brought different perspectives. So um, we were trying to create uh, with these consultations particular platforms for discussion and we also wanted to facilitate uh, uh, exchange of information and knowledge through these consultations. Uh, last but not least, um, we uh, were very keen on building ownership, a certain sense of ownership of the ELD initiative and also of uh, what we perceived uh, to be potential follow-up at country level um, since we were very keen on seeing the recommendations from the ELD initiative um, to possibly be applied, making the next step to actual, um, yes, implementation of the recommendation and practical policy research. Um, and as you know, it is uh, uh, very important to start building that ownership uh, at a very early stage uh, rather than uh, present uh, particularly uh, uh, government counterparts with recommendations and then uh, inviting them to implement them. That very often does not uh, uh, bring uh, the, uh, uh, the best results. Um, so we, as I mentioned earlier, we held uh, uh, consultations uh, last year in three selected countries in Sub-Saharan Africa in Kenya, Sudan, and Tanzania, and uh, one consultation uh, that is taking place in Somalia is currently ongoing. Uh, these countries were uh, selected by the project advisory team uh, of this, uh, of our particular support to the ELD initiative. Um, we had agreed on particular criteria, and unfortunately, we could not. Uh, uh, engage more countries due to uh, uh, financial and time constraints. So um, we hope that uh, with these four countries we uh, have generated uh, uh, sufficient feedback to guide the initiative. Um, the objectives of the consultations were seven in total. Um, one, of course, the most obvious one was uh, to introduce the ELD initiative uh, to all stakeholders. And uh, when I say stakeholders, I mean really representatives uh, from national and uh, subnational government as, uh, as uh, some of the key decision makers, um, uh, also representatives from uh, international organizations, including uh, the UN system, as well as uh, uh, NGOs. Um, also from academia and from research institutions, uh, including uh, local universities and uh, uh, local <coughs> research bodies, um, as well as uh, from uh, representatives from the private sector, uh, and of course the, uh, uh, the people uh, who know sustainable land management issues best uh, since they are, um, you know, facing them every day. Uh, and those are the small scale farmers and women groups uh, and uh, other representatives from civil society. <coughs> uh, secondly, as I mentioned uh, previously, we uh, wanted to better understand the ELD initiative in each specific country context and really contextualize the issues, what uh, uh, were uh, the most uh, uh, important issues in the broad uh, agenda, in the broader SLM agenda uh, in each country. We wanted to generate feedback on the ELD approach and on its challenges and opportunities uh, regarding the possible application of it in the country. 
Um, we wanted to provide recommendations to the ELD initiative uh, to help guide the development of the ELD report uh, to the policy and decision makers, as well as to the development of related tools, uh, which will really be uh, then useful um, for practical application at the country level. Um, we were also hoping to establish a network of SLM stakeholders and uh, uh, practitioners uh, at um, uh, uh, country level, but also to feed them together from the different countries in the broader ELD community. Um, to be able to, yes, stimulate information and knowledge exchange and also to use that network as something to leave behind um, to basically uh, hand this over to uh, the national and subnational stakeholders, what they can use even without uh, uh, the ELD initiative or beyond the ELD initiative. Um, we were also aiming at identifying uh, existing gaps in terms of knowledge uh, related uh, tools and their application at country level and to ensure that the ELD initiative is aware of the specific challenges to sustainable land management implementation at country level. Um, as a global research uh, initiative, uh, I think that was one of our main contribution, as I said in the beginning, to keep the research as realistic and as real as possible. Um, the selection of uh, stakeholders um, for us was guided by uh, certain principles. Overall, we were aiming at uh, um, getting um, and as broad array of stakeholders together as possible. As I said, uh, that meant including community members, government officials, private sector representatives, um, uh, local, national and international research institutions, as well as development practitioners. Um, we also uh, engaged uh, before holding the consultations in each of the selected countries um, in what we called a mapping exercise, basically uh, to establish uh, uh, through a desk review the key SLM issues, the institutions, the stakeholders that uh, uh, we knew would be uh, involved uh, and so findings from there were also feeding into the selection of, uh, 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 of the stakeholders uh, who were attending uh, the consultations. We also uh, asked for advice and uh, some insights of uh, partners that we were working with and who had a, a longer presence in the country that included our UNDP country offices and also other ELD partners, depending on the country context. Um, and uh, the advice also entailed um, uh, some uh, particular uh, considerations uh, um, uh, to emphasize the inclusion of particular groups uh, that tended to be marginalized in some countries. Uh, and last but not least, of course, uh, a focus on gender equality, because all uh, we all know, of course, that uh, the drylands, particularly the drylands development agenda, is first and foremost uh, uh, agenda, uh, a women empowerment agenda. So it was absolutely crucial for us to make sure that uh, um, we involved women, not only to have them physically at the table, but also to prompt them to speak and to contribute. Um, so overall, we were able to bring uh, um, more than 160 uh, uh, participants together in the, uh, in the uh, consultations that we held. Uh, and you can see the different stakeholder groups involved. Um, one thing what is important uh, to point out is that uh, we did not only hold consultations at the national level, um, since uh, 
it was very important to us to get uh, the reflections from uh, the grassroots and uh, from uh, areas that uh, um, might have seemed a little bit removed uh, uh, to the uh, from the capitals of uh, of the countries. So we very purposely uh, did uh, uh, also include uh, the subnational level in Kenya and in Sudan. Um, whereas we didn't feel that we had to do that in Tanzania since we met uh, not in the capital in Dar es Salaam, uh, but in Moshi, which uh, already brought uh, um, also um, representatives from uh, the local government together. So overall, uh, I think uh, that we were um, uh, overall very happy with the outcomes. I'm also looking at Stacy sitting by my side. Um, we felt that we generated a solid practical and in-depth feedback on the ELD initiative uh, uh, and the methodological approach uh, that highlighted context-specific opportunities and challenges. And uh, it was very interesting to see uh, that there were different uh, um, uh, emphasis on particular issues depending on the country. Um, let me emphasize that, for instance, in the consultations, in the subnational consultations in, uh, uh, in Narok County in Kenya, um, the emphasis uh, clearly lay on uh, providing uh, alternative livelihood opportunities. That was uh, extremely important, particularly for women. Uh, since many women there uh, um, had no choice but to cut down uh, the trees they, they loved and appreciated to charcoal because that was the only uh, alternative uh, to try and make some money to provide uh, for their families and put food on the table that very day. Uh, whereas uh, discussions in Sudan clearly focused on the mitigation of uh, violent conflict over the use of natural resources. Uh, given the history and the uh, current issues in Sudan, I think that was uh, not surprising, but it was very interesting for this to come out across the board, uh, also echoed by uh, very high level government officials who were uh, very uh, concerned about that. And so the, um, uh, the issues of uh, uh, alternative livelihoods um, uh, was also uh, very high on the agenda, but particularly in the context of, uh, uh, of avoiding violent conflict. Um, we also felt that uh, uh, the consultations uh, stimulated uh, discussion and strategic engagement beyond the ELD initiative. Uh, since we are based here in Kenya, we know that uh, uh, the networks that we have uh, helped uh, uh, broaden and uh, uh, widen are still active. Uh, what leads me to the third point, and that means that uh, um, the established networks through the bringing together uh, of the different stakeholders were broadened. Uh, people were invited to participate in existing networks and join uh, uh, joint discussions that were already ongoing. And uh, so the collaboration among the key stakeholders uh, uh, was strengthened. And overall, uh, the consultations resulted in a better understanding of the importance of the wider sustainable uh, land management agenda. Uh, and I think we felt very, uh, very fortunate and very humbled to have been able to contribute to that. Um, let me also um, uh, share with you a little bit uh, uh, of what we called food for thought, and that is uh, one of the um, uh, uh, one of the most serious uh, um, reflections. I think was the fact that uh, our engagement uh, clearly raised expectations and demands, and the question therefore is you know, uh, are you really ready for feedback? Are you ready what uh, to receive and to utilize and to manage uh, these uh, expectations and demands? 
and uh, um, really useful uh, and thoughtfully work with the feedback that you receive. Um, and I think that really is, I would like to pass that question on to all of you who might be involved in this type of research, particularly if it is aimed at uh, policy application and, uh, uh, and uh, inflicting change uh, on the ground. The second question also is, how do you maintain engagement? You uh, invest a lot of time and effort, you, you use your relationships through the uh, team of teams of our country offices uh, on the ground to bring people together. How do you maintain that level of enthusiasm and the level of engagement throughout uh, the, the ELD initiative uh, life cycle? Um, and it's very important to calculate that in and to make sure that you share uh, the, the, the feedback that you have generated, that you have shared, um, that you uh, share some other uh, related research findings within the networks that you were able uh, to, uh, uh, to hook into and uh, perhaps establish. Um, and that is very much related to the next point, how to give back your research findings. Um, otherwise, you engage with stakeholders once, and the next time you ask uh, uh, them to be engaged in a, uh, in a different, maybe related piece of research, uh, people will be very politely uh, decline because uh, we have not really been able uh, to give back and uh, involve them the last time. And last but not least, to me, this is really uh, the biggest issue uh, coming. Um, as you know, UNDP is not a research institution, uh, but we are really uh, more uh, uh, practitioners of development. And for us, first and foremost, the question is, how do we action research findings? How do we get uh, what uh, we perhaps all agree on in principle really uh, uh, in, uh, integrated in the national and subnational uh, policy making and planning processes so that we can see an impact of the research and some actual change? Um, so that I think is one of our biggest questions. Um, I just uh, um, noted down here, and I'm sure that uh, this uh, uh, presentation uh, will be available for you. I thought I'd share some uh, links with you that I found uh, useful in our work. And this is uh, a very short selection. I'm sure that there are many others, but uh, they might uh, uh, help stimulate some discussion and they might be useful for your work. Uh, and very often these papers, except for the third one, which is a, is a portal, a web-based portal, uh, but the others are papers and they have a very good uh, uh, reference list. So that might also be useful uh, for you. And with that, I think I would like to thank you for your patience uh, to listen to me. I hope uh, you could hear me well. And uh, I would say uh, Stacy and I are very happy to welcome any questions, any thoughts, any, uh, any reflections from your side, uh, uh, anything at all that uh, uh, came to mind while I was talking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation, very rewarding, I see. Uh, that <coughs> feedbacks come comes in uh, in the chat box as well. So welcome uh, to all those who joined in the meantime. Uh, now it's time uh, to take questions. Um, I see questions already coming in. Um, here is. Um, a question by Ali Salah, who is our um, other online tutor. If, if he has a webcam, he may switch it on. Uh, and the question is, what were your biggest challenges in defining the stakeholders? Um, I, can, I can answer that. Uh, we wanted to make sure, as Anne talked about, that we, get, we got a good um, selection. 
that we want to include the private sector at all levels, including the small-scale farmers, that we wanted civil society, and of course we wanted the government people there. So Anne mentioned that we did a mapping exercise. This also helped us identify the right organizations and the right people. So I think a lot of it is, is preparing ahead of time who you want to talk to and make sure that you get a good mix. Yeah, if I may add to that, uh, um, you know, each of the groups uh, um, uh, Stacy mentioned, uh, even uh, among government counterparts, um, there are uh, quite a number of sensitivities uh, in whom to invite. Of course, uh, you have to be mindful of the, uh, uh, of the local hierarchy, so to speak. But on the other hand, also, it was very important to uh, strike the right mix um, from, uh, you know, to have people help the discussion um, coming from different ministries, because there's a tendency that uh, we all work in our own little silos. Um, and uh, let's say, um, you know, you have uh, uh, particular good relationships with uh, one particular ministry, let's say with the Ministry of Environment. But the Ministry of Environment, very often in the overall country context, are not the ones that need to be persuaded about uh, the usefulness of, uh, uh, of uh, sustainable land management. You're basically preaching to the converted already. So you would like to have uh, people present uh, in those discussions who need to be persuaded, like uh, people from the Ministry of Finance or from the Ministry of National Planning, because they are the ones who can actually have the power to make allocation decisions of national budgets to uh, the priority areas in the country. So uh, there is a lot of, uh, I think, very detailed thinking uh, and uh, uh, um, that has to go into defining who really are the stakeholders you want to have with you on the table in order to not only go over ground that you have already covered so many times before, but to really provoke discussion that can move the whole agenda forward. Okay, there are two more questions. The one is about the readiness for feedback. Here's the question. Uh, do you do some warm-up activities to keep participants open-minded or are there other issues uh, you're thinking of? Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I can take that first and uh, Stacy will, uh, will jump in there as well. The reason why uh, we work very closely through our net of UNDP country offices is because our country offices basically have established relationships and have established networks in each country. Uh, so we don't start from scratch. We are basically uh, asking our colleagues to uh, facilitate uh, these, uh, these discussions, um, even with, uh, with counterparts and with colleagues that uh, they are in touch with on other issues. Uh, very often our uh, activities uh, in each country are part of wider national poverty reduction and environment uh, programs already. So in that sense, um, we don't need any warm-up activities, uh, as, uh, uh, as you mentioned. And in that sense, I think we are also uh, very uh, fortunate uh, to be able to continue with the engagement, because even though we will have a particular event as the consultation, but the counterparts and the, the, the stakeholders who were engaged in that will be kept in the loop through our colleagues on the ground. And that is the same with some of our ELD stakeholders. Um, I know that uh, the uh, IUCN colleagues, who are also based here in Nairobi, have a similar network and are operating on similar principles. So, um, so that is why I think it's really important not to only organize one big event, one-off event, uh, um, gather all these recommendations, and then basically uh, uh, turn our back again on the, on the discussion because we are leaving and we are leaving people behind. I guess the second uh, excuse me. I guess the second question goes in the same direction. How do you follow up with the stakeholders' expectation and demands you had identified after the project is finished? How to ensure continuity? 
Um, perhaps uh, uh, just to, to make it clear, the, the ELD initiative is a global research initiative. It's not a project in the uh, sense of uh, a development project with activities and interventions on the ground. Uh, and that was uh, uh, for us as UNDP a little bit of a difficult message to pass because uh, our stakeholders were very much accustomed to what we do. So uh, when we came to introduce the ELD initiative to them, uh, it basically uh, already meant that, okay, we are talking about uh, a research initiative, but there was the expectation that recommendations from that research will lead to action on the ground. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we haven't quite reached that stage as yet, uh, even though I know that uh, um, uh, colleagues from the ELD initiative uh, are working on it and are hoping to get there. Uh, but that is uh, one of the, the, the issues that uh, uh, we were grappling with a little bit uh, uh, during the consultations. So um, one, uh, uh, a couple of concrete steps that we took was, first of all, we shared uh, with everybody who, was, uh, who had participated um, at least an email network of everybody who was there. Uh, and shared uh, the presentations that were given, as well as the final report in each country. And I know that uh, our colleague, uh, colleagues from the ELD Secretariat have been kind uh, to upload uh, the ELD country reports that we jointly produced uh, with Stacy on their website so that that is available. So uh, we left something behind. Um, in that sense, but uh, stakeholders also um, had the contacts of our colleagues from the UNDP country offices, and they were able to further uh, follow up on, uh, you know, particular requests. Sometimes it was to put people in touch with each other, uh, and uh, uh, so that one was done. If there were any follow-ups that involved uh, Stacy or myself, uh, we were informed and we tried to respond to those requests. Um, I just want to add, as we said uh, two weeks ago, that also Bob Costanza's group has produced some national, they're working on some national level analysis, and also PushBam's group is working on um, some analysis for, I think it's 54 African countries. So our next step will be to take those to national stakeholders, the groups that we've already identified, that we've already engaged with, and see how those tools fit with their needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, uh, sorry, maybe I can add one more thing, sorry. Um, go ahead. The, uh, uh, the other natural uh, connection is uh, also to make, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to widen the national uh, uh, stakeholder uh, networks and uh, uh, link them to the ELD uh, uh, related information and also to uh, particularly for uh, uh, particular capacity building needs, um, also to the Global uh, Soil Leadership Academy, that is an initiative mm -hmm. uh, that is a joint collaboration between the ELD Secretariat and the uh, Secretariat of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. Um, so it's really to have an avenue to pass on uh, information and knowledge that is already existing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be glad to take uh, some audio questions. So if you uh, have a microphone and uh, want to talk, um, please raise your hand. I see there's one hand raised, but let me just um, clear that. So um, here comes a request. I will open the microphone in a second, but before I would like to take uh, another question from the chat uh, and um uh, and that question is, have you considered scenario planning as a tool to envision desirable or undesirable futures? Please. So um, this, this addresses what, the work that's been done by PushPam and by Bob. 
And in Bob specifically, you can see he's looked at different scenarios. They're very similar to what was done with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. So some scenarios are where they maximize production, but not long-term sustainability, and then others are where it's more collaborative. And the same with Pushpam, he's looking at the cost of, so of soil erosion and then the cost of sustainable land management and comparing these different scenarios. So these are captured in the other two working groups, and they're very definitely looking at scenarios for, um, for sustainable land management. Okay, so I see a raised hand, and that is by uh, Jenny Chu. So if you have a microphone, okay, go ahead, please. Yes, um, hello, Anne, and hello, Stacy. I would like to ask, um, ask a question about um, private stakeholder. I mean, um, do you actually really uh, do extensive engagement with private stakeholder in your project? So, yeah, the question is about extensive engagement of private stakeholders. And then if you do, then how actually you do it, and is it successful or not? Okay. Um, let, me, let me take the first part. I think there are two dimensions uh, to the answer. Um, I, uh, first of all, uh, I take private stakeholders to mean private sector stakeholders. Yeah. Um, so the private sector uh, is, uh, is a difficult uh, uh, stakeholder in the sense that uh, they tend to be extremely busy and focused on, uh, uh, on their own uh, uh, objectives. And it's not easy um, to uh, get somebody from uh, a busy private sector firm uh, to come and sit in a workshop for uh, at least half a day. Um, we were very uh, fortunate in the case of uh, the national consultation in Kenya. We had a representative uh, from uh, one particular uh, company that was engaged in uh, the production of uh, pesticides and uh, uh, seeds and so forth. So they had uh, their own uh, motivation to uh, understand what we uh, were thinking about uh, sustainable land management. And it was extremely useful uh, to have uh, that person in the room because uh, um, it, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, their perspective kept us uh, very much on focus on what is uh, realistic and practical from their perspective. Um, the reason why we were able to uh, have uh, uh, the participation from that person was because there was a wider network and there is a, a very targeted uh, um, uh, effort to have a collaboration with the private sector. And I let uh, Stacy talk to that a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so the ELD also organized um, in conjunction with the World Sustainable Council, uh, the World Business Council on the Sustainable Development, a meeting of the large scale private sector. And one of the things that we were trying to learn is how to speak the language that resonates with the private sector. So what we've been talking about is how land degradation can be a source of risk to the private sector. So I think we just have to tailor our message in a way that, that they can understand how it's relevant to them. But I also want to say in our consultations, we included even, I think you can define the farmers as private sector. The ELD initiative de defines farmers as part of the private sector. And we also need to look at the small scale sector because they can have a big impact in the rural areas. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Okay, thank you for thank you. Uh, raising that uh, question. I know that Anne Jupner and Stacy have to leave us in a moment, so there's time for one last question, and I'm taking that from the chat. And that is the question, uh, when we say private stakeholders, when you say private stakeholder, does it include participating families also? Um, yes, I think, uh, as Stacy mentioned, uh, the private sector um, has to include also the small-scale farmers. As you know, particularly in Africa, uh, they are the majority of, uh, uh, of uh, sustainable land management uh, stakeholders. Um, so they certainly have to be included. Um, they are, uh, you know, they are different... Uh, dimensions and different uh, um, perspectives from that group, it does matter if you have men or women speak to that, uh, uh, to that theme. Uh, it does matter at, uh, uh, you know, in some cases also what the different ages are because uh, 
particular in uh, uh, in countries here, um, there is social standing associated with age. Uh, and uh, so to be able to, uh, you know, have, uh, uh, you know, to put some weight on some of the messages that come out from the consultations, um, really it is, uh, uh, it's very important uh, to be mindful again on who you consider are your stakeholders. Uh, in many cases, um, there is a tension between small-scale farmers and pastoralist groups because uh, there are different land uses. Um, there is competition over, uh, over uh, agricultural um, uh, land, over grazing land, over water resources. Um, and uh, so, you know, um, when you say, yes, uh, um, you know, do you have to bring in families? Yes, but again, uh, consider very carefully uh, what exactly you mean and bring in the broadest uh, and the most useful representation of the different, uh, of the different uh, families representing the context you, you are working in. Okay, thank you, Anis. Thank you, Stacy. I think we could, all of us could hear um, more and we could go on for hours uh, share, uh, benefiting from your experience uh, in international development and particularly in, with stakeholders in Africa. So thank you very much for this great uh, present, presentation. Thank you, Anis. Uh, thank you, Stacy. Thank you all for your patience to listen to us. It was a real <laughs> pleasure meeting you all, at least virtually. Okay. 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 Thank you. Right. Thank so, you. Um, n next, uh, we we hadn't, or let, let's put it this way, uh, we are still um, talking to a, a, a speaker who may speak uh, next week. If so, uh, we'll uh, send out an invitation with, uh, on the platform uh, this week. If he can't make it, uh, I see you in two weeks. And um, that will be um, on uh, June 1st. I, uh, this will be a presentation that Ali uh, Salha will uh, take uh, over. Uh, Ali and I are currently busy uh, looking at the uh, assignments uh, you have submitted. So please give us some days uh, to do that and um, come up uh, with uh, an appropriate answer and uh, suggestion on how to um, further continue. Um, so I, you, you, this uh, webinar is recorded and you will find the recording on the platform. Give us uh, one or two days uh, to do that. Um, last uh, webinar is already online available. There was an issue with the recording, so we had to take it off and uh, bring it back in, but it's um, it is uh, already available um, on the platform. Go uh, to week three, uh, week two, and uh, you'll find it. And the, this uh, recording, this session's recording, will be available under week three. So that's from my side. Um, now we come to the fun part. I'll open the webcams. Um, so everybody, everybody who has a, a webcam, yes, here we go, um, may switch on their webcam. And I see Jenny already. Hello, FM in Rome. Hello, Toby in Bonn, Ali in Utah, US, Irina Kazakova. Hello, uh, Sabrina Gapot. Hello. Um, I see Armand is leaving us. So this is always my favorite part. Oh. 
seeing you all live and in color <laughs> uh, all around the world. Um, so here's a question from Sabrina. Is uh, Anna Hella in my working group? Um, I would have to check that. Uh, there's Anubav. Oh, there's Armand. He didn't leave us already. So, hello. <laughs> Jennifer. Okay. Hello, Anna. It was nice meeting you. Nice having you in this afternoon session. Mm. It's uh, fascinating to have that kind of opportunity to be in one place from uh, all around uh, the world. Um, I know that there have been some issues with the platform. Uh, I know that Java is updating every other week, as at least as it seems so. So it's... Um, I guess that's progress we have to deal with. And so I'm glad that you could um, make it. As I mentioned uh, before we started, oh, I should stop the recording. <laughs> 